For over 70 years, one image has stood above all others as a symbol of patriotism, valor, and service. A World War II icon that represents the values of the U.S. Marine Corps. As a Marine, that image captures the fighting spirit and the willingness to overcome all obstacles in order to win. It has inspired books and movies. The flag raising is immortalized in one of our most revered war memorials. But now a new investigation suggests that the official record is wrong and the picture conceals an extraordinary case of mistaken identity. How can this be that history could be wrong and there could be a mystery flag raiser somewhere? It's taken a number of remarkable people from many different backgrounds to unravel this 70-year-old mistake. To prove that one brave man has been completely ignored by history. An unsung hero whose place in this most celebrated image can now be revealed. We have an amazing, uniquely American mystery. The investigation that would ultimately reveal the forgotten Marine unfolded over more than a decade. The first clues emerged in 2005, quite unexpectedly. During production of Clint Eastwood's feature film, Flags of Our Fathers, based on James Bradley's best-selling book. On Flags of Our Fathers, I was hired as a military tech to advisor. And my job as an advisor is to work with the director, the art department, the prop master. We put together actual photographs from the battle so we can match the clothing, the helmets, the boots they're wearing. All this is researched. So we gave this to wardrobe and props. They can match the pictures exactly. The flag raising picture the, is the most iconic uh, picture ever. Is one of the most reproduced images of all time. In a split second, it captured all the heroism of US Marines as they fought together, struggled together, too often died together in a brutal war of attrition. In 1945, racing toward Japan, Marines hit the beaches of Iwo Jima. They confronted an enemy that would fight to the death. The image of that flag, planted for the first time in Japanese soil, would cheer a war-weary nation. And ever since, it has embodied American values, a band of brothers triumphing over adversity to raise a flag that symbolized victory. No wonder the six servicemen identified in that photograph have long been hailed as heroes. Ira Hayes, Franklin Sousley, Mike Strank, Rene Gagnon, John Bradley, and Harlan Block. The book and movie, Flags of Our Fathers, focuses on the man who became most famous, hospital corpsman John Bradley. He wasn't a Marine, but a medic in the Navy. Bradley's equipment came up uh, one day. We weren't even filming yet. The prop master came up to me and says, hey, what is Bradley wearing? We know what a corpsman wore. So we're shaking out. We start looking at the uh, iconic picture of the flag raising and go, wait a minute, that's not what Bradley's wearing. And I'm going, holy mackerel. You're looking at these photographs and you're wondering what's going on. And you're going, something doesn't match. James Deaver was confronting six years of established wisdom. In 2005, I was a student at the Marine Corps Command and Staff College. And Deaver called me, and he had been working on Flags of Our Fathers, and he said, you know, I found something interesting. And I told him what we found out. 
I didn't really think that was possible. I mean, we knew who the flag raisers are. Even though I thought that there was a logical explanation for more than 10 years, I really couldn't let this idea go. For Marines like Morgan and Deaver, the image's power comes not just from what it shows, but from when it was taken during one of the bloodiest fights in the Corps' history. By early 1945, the U.S. has been at war for over three years. After the D-Day invasions of occupied France, the fighting in Europe is drawing to a close. But in the Pacific, war against the Empire of Japan still rages. U.S. forces battle their way from island to island, fighting an enemy for whom suicide is more honorable than surrender. But to launch an attack on the Japanese heartland itself, they must first conquer a speck of land called Iwo Jima. The island is barren and isolated. Yet, it has something worth fighting for. Airfields, the U.S. desperately needs. It was a very important uh, shift in strategy towards the end of the war. This required the Marines to seize advanced air bases for uh, the, the air forces that are going to be bombing Japan. It was what the Japanese considered their home terrain. But it's a midway point between the Marianas Islands, where the B-29 super fortresses are launching from, and the Japanese home islands. The Japanese defenders are dug deep into the volcanic rock in a series of bunkers and connecting tunnels. Altogether, 70,000 U.S. troops will confront roughly 20,000 Japanese. An armada of U.S. warships steams toward the island fortress. The Marines on board are little more than boys, many of them too young to vote, some of them too young to drink. Most had never heard of Iwo Jima before this. They can have little idea of the hell that waits for them. This was the first time I seen combat, yes, sir. I had veterans around me that said, don't worry, you know, hey, that we be all right. We'll be out of here in a day or two. Nothing to it, a piece of cake, they'd say, you know. There's 45,000 Marines going to hit this island, and it's only eight square miles. But they forgot to tell us there's 22,000 Japanese defending. February 19th, D-Day. Landing craft and amphibious tanks ferry Marines toward the beaches. They scramble ashore, and the nightmare begins. When we hit the beach, it was a slaughter. The boat next to us had a direct hit from the mountain. It probably killed about 30 of the men in it. That kind of put the fear of God in you right there, you know. So that, then you see them falling, falling like flies, trying to get onto the beach. It was not a pleasant place to be. Japanese were in tunnels and caves. Uh, you had to be very lucky to even see them. You were always exposed. There is no place to hide. Casualties are appalling. A 
The Marine is struck down roughly every 30 seconds. By the end of the first day, over 2,000 will be dead or wounded. It was violent, it was uh, casualty intense, and death came from all directions. Much of the hail of lead and steel comes from the island's high ground, a dormant volcano named Mount Suribachi. It is on this volcano that a brave Marine patrol will eventually plant the flag and trigger the iconic photograph. Almost 70 years later, and over 6,000 miles away, a reporter is about to get a lead that will raise a giant question mark over the official record of that image. Ever since World War II, the names of the servicemen in the famous Iwo Jima flag raising had been established. But evidence has emerged that one of the men was misidentified. By 2014, the investigation to correct the record is centered in Omaha, Nebraska. I was at my desk. An email popped in. It was from a man I didn't know uh, named Eric. And he wanted me to look at some research he'd been doing on World War II. Um, I think he mentioned Iwo Jima but uh, it was pretty general. The day that I was gonna meet him, I was gonna show up, be really polite, shake his hand, hear him out for maybe 15, 20 minutes, and never think about it again. He started showing me his photos and his research, and I was there for three hours. And as he started walking through it, I went from, this is crazy, to, oh my gosh, this is starting to make sense, to, I completely believe this guy and what he's saying. The man that Hansen met with was amateur military historian, Eric Crelly. My real true passion is military history, um, collecting, just studying World War II, Korea, the Vietnam War. My uncle, Robert Wayne Lauritsen, who was with the 13th Marine Artillery Regiment, was in the 5th Marine Division. He landed on Iwo Jima on D-Day, February 19th, 1945. In 2012, I started a website called fifthmarinedivision.com to start recognizing what the members of the 5th Marine Division did in World War II. And over the years, it became more of a situation where people were contacting me and sending in information. In late 2013, Crelly is contacted through his website by a man in Ireland. Stephen Foley has no connection whatsoever to the U.S. Marine Corps, yet he shares Crelly's fascination with Iwo Jima. And like the flags of our father's technical advisor, he had questions about the clothing and equipment worn by the most famous flag raiser, medic John Bradley. As I conversed with him going forward, I became very aware that, yeah, this guy knows what he's talking about. Crelly was now drawn into the investigation. Over the next several months, once me and Mr. Foley had spoken about this, we pored over photos every night. The key to solving the puzzle was to scour other images that might hold clues to the identities of the flag racers. It's important to note that the famous photo was not the only one taken on Suribachi that day. There were a lot of photos taken of many of the main participants. These pictures were all taken within a few hours. And as Crowley examined them, he began to ask himself the central question. Why did the man in the famous picture, who was supposedly Corman John Bradley, actually look nothing like him? If we look at photos of John Bradley taken at this time, he does not have on a soft cap underneath his helmet. The figure in the photo is wearing a cap under his helmet, its peak clearly visible. The next major thing to look at are his trousers and how he wore them. 
The figure in the photo wore his trousers loosely over his boots and potentially leggings, but you don't see leggings in the photo. And contrasting that with John Bradley, he wore his trousers tightly cuffed well above his leggings so that you could clearly see his leggings in all of the photos. And finally, a huge thing is what we're calling Unit 3 bags, which John Bradley wore during his time on Suribachi, which contained all of his medical supplies, which a rifleman would not be carrying. The figure in the famous photograph is not wearing Unit 3s. Could Bradley have changed his clothing and equipment between the different photographs? Or was the flag raiser identified as Bradley, in fact, someone completely different? The image itself is so important to United States Marines and the Marine Corps culture that it's fundamentally sacrilegious for Marines to even step forward and question the notion of who might be in the photo. At the same time, as Marine leaders, we're always focused on taking care of our Marines. And it seemed irresponsible, an unmarine, in fact, to go on knowing that there might be this individual Marine here who had been unrecognized. The battle for Iwo Jima holds a hallowed place in Marine Corps history. One quarter of all Marines killed in World War II died in just one month's fighting to take the island. It is an iconic fight. It demonstrates the uh, perseverance, the difficulty of overcoming probably one of the greatest challenges ever to face a military force uh, employed by the United States. And the savage combat was captured on film, up close. Riding in with the Marines were men shooting not guns, but pictures. Their images put us in the thick of it. Among them is a civilian risking his life to tell this story. Associated Press photojournalist Joe Rosenthal. It's Rosenthal who will capture the historic image. That moment will also be caught as footage by Marine cameraman Staff Sergeant Bill Janoust. This film will provide the vital visual evidence that will finally settle the flag raiser's identities. Janaus lands on the beach and comes under the same reign of fire. Day five of the battle. Many thousands of Marines have fallen. To stop the slaughter, they must take the high ground, Mount Suribachi. 40 men from Easy Company are ordered on what seems like a suicide mission to the top of the volcano. Among them, Navy Corpsman John Bradley. They take an American flag to raise if they get to the top. Any moment, they expect to come under a rain of fire. But incredibly, they make it to the summit and raise the flag. It is the first time the Stars and Stripes fly over Japanese soil. Everybody's jubilant down there. Boy, I, you know, it, we took this mountain. Everybody was happy and rejoiced. We're all having fun, clapping each other on the back. And, we thought, well, the war's over. Our flag's on their land. How can they fight anymore, you know? But the fight is not over. And this is not the flag that will become an immortal part of our nation's history. The effect of the flag is so powerful, the brass wants it replaced by a bigger one that can be seen from further away. Marine runner Rene Gagnon hurries up the mountain with a bigger flag. Coleman Bradley is still on the peak with the first patrol. Also climbing Suribachi are photographer Joe Rosenthal and cameraman Bill Genost. 
at the top the flag that cheered the U.S. forces. And then, almost before the cameramen are ready, the second flag goes up. Rosenthal barely has time to raise his camera to his eye. He doesn't even know if he got the shot. Suribachi may have been secured, but the brutal fighting to take the rest of the island rages on. There was only on one little corner of the island. They didn't know the worst was yet to come. Meanwhile, Rosenthal sends his film to Guam for processing. The image that emerges is extraordinary. Within days, President Roosevelt himself will see it. And the question of who is in the picture will become a matter of national importance. But the evidence is mounting that this question has been answered incorrectly for over 70 years. In the midst of the brutal battle for Iwo Jima, the photograph captured a historic instant, one that embodied the heroism of US Marines in World War II. Now amateur historian Eric Crelly has turned that image into a puzzle. He's found evidence suggesting the famous flag raiser identified as Navy medic John Bradley is actually someone completely different. We knew that Eric Crelly had a very sound theory, but it, his approach lacked scientific rigor. If we were going to make a strong case, the case we knew we would have to build, the evidence needed to be examined scientifically. They turned to Michael Plaxton, who works as an expert witness in criminal cases. His job is to scour crime scene imagery, seeking evidence that will stand up in court. Plaxton starts by looking for what sets John Bradley apart. Unlike the others, he wasn't a Marine. He was a Navy corpsman. His primary role was not as a warrior, but as a medic, tending to his wounded comrades. John Bradley was unique among all those men because he was a corpsman. He was unique in the equipment he carried, um, and he was unique in the duties that he performed, of course. This is a picture of uh, John Bradley on the day of the flag raising. This is actually taken at the first flag raising, and if we look at him, he's dressed in what we would expect a corpsman to be wearing in the field. We see here as unit three. Here's his canteen, his K-bar, and his standard issue first aid kit. The other thing we want to look at is his pant legs, which are cuffed. And if you look at them, you can see they're, they're very firmly cuffed. This is not loosely rolled. That's a tight cuff, and they're very high above his shoes. The person that was identified as John Bradley his dress is very, very different from what we see on John Bradley earlier in the day. He's carrying uh, wire cutters. He's wearing a cartridge belt. So these are things that you wouldn't expect to see any corpsman, including John Bradley, to be wearing. But if that isn't John Bradley in the picture, there's an obvious next step for the investigation. I think what's most important is saying, if this is not John Bradley, who is it? The visual evidence points to another serviceman who was photographed on the mountain that day. Other photos of this person on top of Sir Bocci show him wearing a soft HBT cap underneath his helmet, a cartridge belt, wire cutter pouch on his belt, uncuffed trousers. These details match exactly with a man who had been identified as Bradley in the famous picture. But was Crelly right? For Plaxton, the key to confirming the ID was the footage shot by Marine cameraman Bill Janoust. My next step was to 
follow the film frame by frame. And if we follow it through, we do end up in a position uh, of these three men at the flagpole. This frame matches precisely the second photograph Joe Rosenthal took that day, one that actually shows the man's face. The face not of John Bradley, but of a rifleman in the Easy Company, Private First Class Franklin Sousley. Based on my experience, 35 years of uh, doing work like this, um, and as a forensic expert, there's no doubt in my mind that the person seen in this photograph that it was identified as John Bradley is actually Franklin Sousley. Sousley was only 19 years old when he hit the beach on Iwo Jima. He came from Kentucky. Four weeks after the picture was taken, he was shot down by a Japanese sniper, just days before the island was finally conquered. By the time John Bradley first sees the picture, he's in the hospital, recovering from wounds he'd sustained in action on Iwo Jima. For his service, he would later be awarded the Navy Cross, the nation's second highest decoration for valor. Shown a blurred newspaper copy, he couldn't pick himself out, but he's told he's in the photo. I can imagine the circumstances by which he would be confused. He's told he's in the photo, but he's in a place that may or may not make sense to him. I would have to think that he felt somewhat trapped. Bradley, I honestly believe, misunderstood what photographed because he was up there. He did put the first flag up, and he says it was the proudest moment of his life. The identification of Sousley in the place of Bradley doesn't solve the puzzle of the iconic photograph. Because Franklin Sousley is already in the picture. He'd been ID'd as the man in number two spot. Incorrectly, it now turns out. If this is not Franklin Sousley in this position, there's a, a giant mystery as to who this final character is in this flag-raising photograph. If Sousley takes Bradley's place, who is the unknown Marine? His clothing and equipment mean it can't be Bradley. So who is the man whose role in one of our country's most iconic images has never been acknowledged? The flag raisings on Iwo Jima took place on day five of the battle. I remember casualties every day, every day, casualties and very little progress. It took us 36 days to uh, get from one end of a five-mile island to the other, losing three-quarters of your men. Conquering Iwo Jima will cost almost 7,000 American servicemen their lives. Another 20,000 are wounded. In this bloodbath, the flag raisings on Mount Suribachi are quickly forgotten by the Marines. But on the other side of the world, just two days after it was taken, Joe Rosenthal's picture appears on front pages across the US. The country that wakes up to the photograph on that Sunday morning is worn out by the war. Tired of sending their young men off to fight in unknown faraway places. In this atmosphere of fatigue, the picture comes as a sensation. When the image got back to the United States, it was representative of the fighting spirit. And if those men were still inspired to fight, then back home, we should be as well. All of a sudden, millions of Americans see an image that embodies the hope of victory. Almost immediately, the PR value of the picture becomes obvious, a perfect emblem to boost the American public's support for the war and get them to continue to pay for it. 
During World War II, the government relied not on taxes, but on sales of war bonds to fund the enormous cost of waging the war. President Roosevelt himself sees that the photograph would be an ideal symbol to appeal to the nation's patriotism. The president orders the Marine leadership to identify those six men and bring them home as heroes. From the very beginning, the efforts to fulfill this order will be mired in confusion. The Marine Corps didn't ask for the flag raisers to be identified until almost a month after the flag itself had been raised. Until President Roosevelt sent word that he wanted to bring back the survivors of the flag raising, the uh, business of the flags had no priority at all. We were fighting, fighting for our lives. All they knew was that a runner named Rene Gagnon had carried the second flag up the mountain. He was one of the six. It would now be on him to pick out the other five. Of the names he recalls, three had been killed in action in the days and weeks after the flag raising. They were Sergeant Mike Strank, an immigrant from Czechoslovakia, the rifleman Franklin Sousley, and Sergeant Hank Hansen from Massachusetts. For the other three, Gagnon lists himself, John Bradley, and Ira Hayes. In the coming weeks, both Hayes and Bradley are assigned to different positions in the picture until the Marine Corps finally settles on an official lineup. So to this point, Bradley's been in three different positions on the photo. Hayes has been in two. But the details of the identities are brushed aside. The government needs the surviving flag raisers for their new mission, a mission perhaps as vital as the battle for Iwo Jima, the seventh war bond drive. The government needs billions of dollars to continue the fight in the Pacific. Bradley Gagnon and Hayes dutifully tour the country, but Bradley repeatedly tries to divert the spotlight onto the real heroes, the boys whose bodies lay in the cemetery on Iwo Jima. They thought it was something they had to do. They was told to do it, just like going into battle because it's going to raise enough money to buy enough tanks and airplanes and else to finish the war. So I thought it was their job. Like the others, Bradley's duty now is to help sell war bonds. I am certain that he understood the role he had to play as a flag raiser. And if at any point he recognized that he wasn't in the photo, he understood that that role was more important to the country at that point. Headed by the trio, the bond tour raises over $26 billion, more than half of the government's entire budget for 1945. All this time, Ira Hayes was convinced there was a mistake in the flag raiser's identities. In late 1946, he convinces the Marine Corps to investigate the identity of the Marine at the base of the flagpole. That serviceman is now determined to be Corporal Harlan Block, not Hank Hansen. Hansen had been at the first flag raising, but he's not in the Rosendahl picture of the second. Both Hansen and Block died just six days after it was taken. Gagnon and Bradley had been sure Hansen was one of the flag raisers, showing how easy it was to be confused. I am Rene Gagnon, Jr son of Rene Gagnon, the flag raiser. You have to understand that when he ran up the hill, took the flag out, he wasn't looking around per se to say, OK, who's here? You got to figure you're under battle, you're being shot at, and your idea is just let's get that flag out, plant it in the ground, and be done with it. Misidentification could have easily happened. The fog of war what I would categorize as the chaos of combat is very real. The number of things going on simultaneously, with a battle raging below, it's not hard for me to imagine that they would be confused about who was involved at a particular moment in time. The Marine Corps had now officially established the flag raiser's IDs. 
six brave men had been chosen to represent American heroism. The Marine Corps continued to stand by the investigation that had been conducted. To them, the case was closed, and convincing them we would require that we develop an exceptionally compelling case. And key to that case is identifying the mystery man who takes Franklin Sousley's place in the picture. This mystery, it's a huge undertaking. I started watching the, the film shot by Bill Janoust as the flag was going up. I watched that movie I don't even know how many times. I watched it frame by frame, night after night, studying every little detail that I could. And then finally, late one night, I saw it. If you watch Bill Janoust's footage and you freeze it at this one particular spot, you can see exactly what sets this Marine apart from everyone else that day. You can clearly see something dangling from this Marine's helmet. What was it? Was it a piece of cloth? Was it a vine? Was it a wire? Something was hanging off this guy's helmet, and I had to figure out what it was. One of the other photographs taken on the mountain that day gives Crelly the clue he needs. It's known as the gung-ho picture, and like a team photo, it identifies the men of the patrol. There was one Marine that stood out because he appeared to have a large, like, dark scar across the front of his face. Turns out it was a shadow because there was a strap hanging from his helmet and causing a shadow to cast across his face. An analyst, Michael Plaxton, spots something else that singles this man out, a forensic clue that will confirm his identity beyond a reasonable doubt. While I was examining the footage, I noticed that the mystery man had some trouble uh, with his weapon. He kept having to shrug his shoulder to keep it up there. It looks in a rather uncomfortable position, and it's hanging much lower than the other men's rifles here and here. What is going on is that this person's rifle isn't slung correctly. This part of the strap, the sling for the rifle, should actually be much farther back on the stock, and that allows it to hang more comfortably and snugly. His is hanging from a different spot on the barrel, something called a stacking swivel. Janaus footage provides the final piece of the puzzle that will reveal the identity of the mystery Marine. By linking the man whose rifle was slung incorrectly to the gung-ho photograph, the one picture that identifies the Easy Company Marines. The film shows the men lined up for Rosenthal's photo. This is the man with a shadow cast by his helmet strap. Three seconds later, he raises his rifle and reveals that his sling is attached in the wrong place. We know the name of that man in the gung-ho photograph, the man with a hanging helmet strap and misslung rifle. The man who helped raise the flag over Iwo Jima and who was captured in the iconic image. He is an easy company mortarman, private first class, and his name is Harold Henry Schultz. At this point, the investigators knew almost nothing about Harold Schultz other than his name. He had never claimed his place in the picture. Had he, like so many other Marines, died in combat? Or was he still alive all these years later? It is time to finally fulfill President Roosevelt's 1945 order and track down the forgotten hero of Iwo Jima. The investigators have identified the unknown flag raiser of Iwo Jima, a 19-year-old Marine from Michigan named Harold Schultz. I remember Harold Schultz. I'd describe him as a regular Marine. 
He didn't shy from nothing. He was a great guy. Got along with everybody. We, all, we talked occasionally. Just talk about home all the time. That's about all there was to talk about there. Who you left behind? Census records show he grew up in Detroit. He enlisted there in late 1943, a month shy of his 18th birthday. He could not have known that he would end up in a defining moment of history. And in that instant, embody all Marines. What Schultz did is what we'd expect of any Marine, is he saw his fellow Marines struggling. He stepped in, he lent a hand, and then he stepped away. Schultz survived the Battle of Iwo Jima, but he was wounded in action and awarded a Purple Heart. Because he was never named as a flag raiser, he then disappeared from history. Those who had been named returned to civilian life after the war. Gagnon and Bradley each married and raised families. Ira Hayes was less fortunate. He struggled with alcoholism for the rest of his life. Just 10 years after the battle, he died, alone one night on the Gila River Reservation in Arizona. Like the others, when the war was over, Harold Schultz took off his uniform and became a civilian again. No pictures have been found of him after the war, but we have glimpses of his life. He chose not to settle back in Michigan, but to start anew in California. He took a job with the Postal Service working the swing shift in LA's Chinatown. In the early 1970s, Schultz formed a friendship with his next door neighbor, Rita Reyes, and her 19-year-old daughter, Desreen. He would have dinner with them for nearly 18 years before he and Rita decided to marry. His stepdaughter was interested in the war, though she says Schultz rarely spoke about it. But once over dinner, he surprised her by saying he was one of the flag racers. Then he added that he wasn't a hero. He was a Marine and changed the conversation. After his death, she went through his belongings. Among them was a copy of the gung-ho photo signed by photographer Joe Rosenthal. And on the back, final confirmation that Harold Schultz was the mystery flag racer. He had handwritten the names of the Easy Company Marines, identifying himself as the man with the shadow. The man who Crowley and Plaxton's research proves was part of the iconic moment. We have an, an amazing, uniquely American mystery where uh, a man who worked for the U.S. Postal Service and, as far as we know, never said a single word about the fact that he was in maybe the most famous photo in American history. I don't know if he knew he was in the photo, but I think he probably did. That's a great story a story that the investigators are now ready to present to the people who ultimately needed to be convinced. The first thing we did was we looked at it with my uh, staff here at History Division. I recommended to form a board uh, because this is a pretty significant uh, change to the narrative. We wanted to make sure that uh, we didn't make another mistake. The board takes its recommendations to the Commandant of the Marine Corps. General Robert Neller. Our findings basically were that uh, the individual that we had previously identified as uh, Doc Bradley uh, was not him. There is, in my mind, uh, and I believe in the mind of the board, uh, a very high probability the individual raising that flag was uh, a Marine named Harold Schultz. Harold Schultz can now finally be remembered. More than 20 years after his death in 1995 and more than 70 years after the battle. As a flag raiser, but more importantly, as a Marine who fought for his country in one of its most historic battles. A 
group of outsiders, including a war buff from Omaha, had overturned the official record and corrected a 70-year-old mistake. That makes me really happy that he would get that credit. Yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> that changes history. As Marines, our history is important to us. Clarifying that history remains important as well. But what's most significant about this image is and is emblematic of the more than 70,000 who served on that island as part of a team that sacrificed in the name of victory. For the historical record, we need to get it right. But it doesn't change how we view the flag raising. It's what they did and what they represented that remains the most important thing.